This is a production of Cornell University. What's going on? We good? I'm back? All right, so I first want to, and I did this yesterday, but I'll do this today again. Thank you so much to the students. Like, I've been on both sides of, uh, now I've been on both sides of uh, both inviting people as grad students as a committee, and then it's, it's awesome to be invited by people. You know, it's, uh, we do this job and we toil away sometimes, and then it, it's nice to know that at some level, like, people, people recognize you, so that's awesome. Um, yeah, uh, so the talk I'll give today is completely different than the talk I gave yesterday. Uh, what I like to do in my lab is focus on a broad a variety of topics. I'm just a naturally curious person, um, and I like bacteria, and so luckily bacteria do pretty much everything in the world, and so there's a ton of topics to dive into. The topic I'll talk about today was something that I really started probably my third or second or third year having a lab, and it really just blossomed from there. Um, we've got some really good people at Arizona that contribute greatly and kind of drive this project in a lot of ways too that I'll, I'll acknowledge now. So Betsy Arnold is, is an awesome collaborator. Uh, Rachel Gallery is an awesome collaborator, and they're fully involved in this as well. So I, uh, I can't take any uh, personal credit. It's, it's, we work really well together as a team. So I just want to say that up front, and then I'll, I'll acknowledge Rachel and Betsy at the end as well. Um, all right, so my talk today is going to be on a, a symbiosis, uh, or maybe a symbiosis an interaction at least, that um, I had no clue existed uh, until I really started my lab. So I was very focused on Pseudomonas syringae and then started reading papers. And, and uh, once you start reading more broadly and you have some time to read more broadly, you, you, it opens your eyes into a variety of different ways that interactions can happen. Uh, to begin, though, um, and as, as a, you know, just to warm the room here to a little bit, um, I'm going to talk about a, a horrible human pathogen outbreak uh, that happened in about 1976. Uh, so in 1976, there was a convention of American Legion folk um, in Philadelphia. And so this convention had, takes place, and uh, it was during the summer, I think, of the Spanish flu or one of the flus that came through. And so people went to the convention. A lot of people got sick, and, and some people died from this convention. There was a mystery as to what the actual cause of this pathogenicity was, where this, where this infection came from. Uh, it turns out that after a bunch of epidemiology and some microbiology and some um, really cool genetics work, uh, the conventioners, uh, the, the American Legion folk, uh, were actually infected by a strain of Legionella, which is now called Legionella. It was called something different back then. It's Legionella because American Legion Convention. Uh, Legionella has a pretty interesting life cycle where it'll just kind of grow uh, in human environments because there's amoeba in human environments. And so the amoeba really like the water. The Legionella can get into amoeba. Um, kind of survives intracellularly in amoeba, um, and all is well and good. Um, nothing is involving human pathogenicity there, and everything is kind of, kind of hunky-dory. The problem is that amoeba look a lot like uh, some uh, human immune cells, and so because Legionella has evolved to infect amoeba, it's also really good at infecting human immune cells, certain types of human immune cells like macro macrophage. Uh, and so what we think happened um, is that a lot of different bacteria can evolve to live inside of a variety of different uh, eukaryotic microorganisms like amoeba. Sometimes we get the secondary uh, spillover into things like human pathogenicity, potentially things like plant pathogenicity. And so just setting the stage here, um, there's a lot of precedent for um, some work in some systems showing that bacteria can really proliferate and survive well in a variety of different eukaryotic microbes. Uh, the Legionella system and the amoeba system is actually, amoeba are basically used as a, an analog of, of macrophage now a lot of different labs and the genetics actually works out pretty well. Um, so there's papers showing, uh, you know, amoeba survival, addicti, addictostelium ends up being a good model system for this as well. Um, and as um, some labs here have shown um, as well and, and contributed greatly to, uh, this is not limited just to just protists or other single celled eukaryotes. Um, it seems like this is a more widespread phenomenon where there's a lot of microscopic eukaryotes that can be infected by or at least host um, different types of bacteria. Uh, I really started this project because, so I started in about 2012, 2013, when the microbiome wave was happening and everybody's microbiome was getting sequenced. And um, the joke used to be that when I made this slide, there was the only thing that didn't have a microbiome was an otter. Now there's an otter microbiome even. Um, so there's microbiomes for everything. Um, and there's a variety of systems where it's been shown that I'm at least at the level of uh, plus or minus bacteria. Um, this seems to affect development and physiology across a variety of different eukaryotes. Uh, what I want to focus on, though, is that there's been a good legacy of, of at some level, at some very specific level, uh, investigating interactions between bacteria and fungi. And so 
you know, I, when I started my lab and when I was starting reading papers, I didn't have a good appreciation that fungi actually hosted a microbiome. Um, but once I started digging in, it, it kind of makes sense. Like lichens are well known. Um, lichens are effectively a fungal microbiome. Um, there's a Burkholderia rhizoxynica system, um, and then a, a Candidatus glomerobacter. I don't know, I'm, I'm not the greatest fan of bacterial nomenclature, but basically there's a, a, another candidate that can be in, in a variety of micro, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, there's other systems where uh, these other uh, very specialized, it seems, bacteria have evolved to intimately interact with their fungal hosts. They seem to be vertically inherited. Um, they seem to be, there's some certain genomic properties there that actually contribute to this symbiosis. And so there's this legacy of, of at least at very specialized levels, understanding that bacteria can interact with fungi, can be intrahyphal inside of fungi, and can manipulate fungal uh, behavior and physiology. But again, when I started, um, I didn't have this appreciation, and I think hopefully I've contributed to expanding this, uh, this theme throughout a variety of different systems. Uh, so this work really started, the work I'll talk about today really started uh, about 2013. I emailed Betsy Arnold, I read a paper, um, it might have been Teresa's paper, it might have been a different paper using the same system, um, where I read a paper showing that type 3 secretion was involved in this Burkholderia rhizoxynica um, system. And so um, I was coming from Jeff Dangle's lab working on type 3 secretion in Pseudomonas syringae. I saw, hey, type 3 secretion in bacteria. Maybe I can jump into the system. Maybe I can figure out some stuff with the factors and, and type 3 secretion in fungal hosts. Um, I email, emailed Betsy Arnold and said, hey, is there any way we can team up and, and actually work on this? And she said, oh, I got a system for you. Like, let's not work. On, like, there's a lot of people who are working on the Burkholderia. Let's work on this other completely different system that, that we have no clue what to make of it, but I think there's something there. I'm like, all right, like fair game, let's go for it. Um, so all of this work just um, started with an email um, and it kind of went from there. So what I'll talk about today builds off of Betsy Arnold's work um, and Betsy Arnold's, a variety of people in Betsy's lab where they identified in, uh, a variety of different bacteria that can actually interact pretty intimately um, and in, in an endohyphal way with a variety of fungal uh, epi, uh, endophytes. And so I'll talk about today, I'll just give you an overview of this system kind of tell you a little bit about the background and the diversity of this. And then I'll talk about my role and uh, how my questions interact with this system. And so here's the overview. Um, you know, just tell me what that microphone fell off. So I will just put it back on. I guess I move a lot. So sorry about that. Um, all right, so with the overview. I'm a native New Yorker, so I'm not used to microphones. I just kind of scream at people, but <laughs> so, not very. Um, all right, so with the overview, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the bacterial symbionts of fungi and kind of Betsy's story working into this. Um, and then I'll start to get to the, the nitty gritty of it. So if we know that there's bacteria inside of hyphae, we can ask questions like, you know, do they alter fungal phenotypes? Is there any way that we can control this symbiosis and maybe engineer it in different ways? What do the bacteria get out of this partnership? Can we do uh, genetics? Is there a type 3 secretion system? You know, all of these questions about interactions that really I've, I've come to from the plant pathology side, but I'm, I'm really just curious about how these interactions evolve, what kinds of genetic structures these interactions, and how going forward, um, you know, how we can predict and manipulate these interactions, maybe for the benefit of, of uh, agriculture or, you know, we're never going to feed 9 million people, but we can, we can feed at least a couple more, I think. So an overview, um, bacterial symbionts of fungi. I'm not going to show many pictures of plants. Um, I have a hard time growing plants. And I'm not a, I don't have a green thumb. I'm in a plant sciences department, but I can't grow plants very well. Um, so what I can do is I can isolate bacteria from a variety of different plants. And so a lot of what I'll talk about today takes place in the context. You have to imagine, you know, put your thinking caps on. Imagine it's all taking place in the context of uh, plants like this. So this is Platycladius orientalis, basically a juniper, um, juniper berry kind of plant. Um, the needles on it are like pine needles. They're kind of coniferous and tough. Um, all of the fungi that I'll talk about for the most part of today were isolated from this type of plant. And all the bacteria I'll talk about from those fungi are theoretically living either on the, the needles or inside of the fungi, inside of the, the Russian doll that is this whole system. Um, if you look across different plant species, um, I don't know if there's an exception to this. I'm pretty sure there's not, but if, if you sample, all plant species will contain endophytes at some level. Um, a lot of them have fungal endophytes, and these fungal endophytes contribute to different plant behaviors. Some of them have been shown to influence pan, plant uh, physiology and immune systems. They make them a little bit more resistant to pathogens. Uh, some of them are 
potentially uh, pathogens. You know, the, the, every plant species seems to have its own fungal uh, endophytes at some level. Um, these juniper species, and, and Betsy has shown this throughout a variety of plants throughout the world, um, these tend to be covered in fungal endophytes. So if you just sample a little bit of a, a, the pine needle, you'll fee, find a ton of diversity in terms of the fungi that actually live there or live in the roots or live in the stems or live in the, the soil around the fungi or the, around the plant. Uh, the fungi I'll focus on for about three quarters of the talk today are going to be endophytes of leaves. And so they're found within leaves. And that's kind of what Betsy specialized on going uh, around the world. Fungal endophytes of leaves have a kind of an interesting life cycle when you think about it. And so a lot of these are found, um, so when the leaf emerges, it tends to be uh, sterile for, in a lot of plants. The fungi, we think, um, through spores and other ways, get up and infect the leaves as they emerge. Um, and you get a really high level of diversity within a leaf over a short amount of time. So, you know, within a couple of weeks, you get a, a lot of different diverse types of fungi that are actually within these leaves. Um, Eventually though, you know, spoiler alert, everything dies. Um, so eventually the leaf is gonna die, it's gonna fall to the ground. And a lot of these fungi end up being able to switch their life cycle to become sapotrophic. And so they go from endophytes to sapotrophs and we don't really understand that transition. Um, but it's, a, it's a kind of a cool transition if the same fungi are doing both roles. Um, so eventually the sapotrophs break down uh, things in the soil, they sporulate or, or you know, some other mysterious ways they might get up into the air again. Um, but those spores get up into the air, which we think um, then infect those newly emerging leaves. So it really is kind of a Lion King circle of life thing. Um, I have a four-year-old, so I speak in Disney movies a lot of the time, so I apologize for that up front, but if you guys have kids, you understand that uh, very well. Um, Frozen, yeah, I've, I've taken all the Frozen references out, but. All right, so what Betsy showed, and this is where, this is where I come into the story. So I came in right after this paper was published. Betsy and her former grad student slash postdoc, Michelle Offman, uh, had showed in a variety of these fungal endophytes that they seem to contain bacterial symbionts. And it's a cool story to understand. I, this is the story I tell. I think Betsy tells it slightly different, but I like my version better. So Betsy uh, is very, very um, detailed and very specific in how she uh, curates things and cleans things. And her and Michelle were isolating a bunch of these fungi from around the world. We're preparing sterile isolates of it and then putting them in water auger or water or water vouchers. Um, and so over time, they just had this massive collection of water vouchers of fungi, which is basically just fungi in water. Um, every once in a while, they would see bacterial contaminants pop up in the water auger. Um, and they're like, oh, there's, you know, we got to autoclave things better and we got to clean things better and you know, be really, really uh, vehement in, in getting these bacteria out because they thought they were contaminants. When they start to look back at the data, the same contaminants are popping up in the same fungal cultures. And, no matter how well they cleaned, they would get these same contaminants coming up again and again and again. So then Betsy and Michelle were like, oh, maybe they're not contaminants. Maybe they're actually in the fungi and they're just popping out at certain levels. Um, and then, you know, they did some fish. Um, these are fish papers from uh, 16S fish from uh, a couple of different fungi. But basically these dots are uh, bacteria that seem to be within the hyphae of a variety of different fungi. Uh, so again, this is where I come in. Um, what Betsy and Michelle were able to do was just, you know, 16S PCR and, and amplify using amplicon sequencing a variety of these bacterial sequences from the fungi. They built a tree. Um, the tree is going to happen in a second in a couple slides, but um, I will get to that. So we think, um, and this is kind of how Betsy's whole isolation scheme. So we think what happens is that there's just fungi and bacteria inside of those fungi, inside of leaves of things like platycletus. Um, we can plate out the fungi and then, uh, they look like normal fungi. We just plate them out on just normal auger. Um, bacteria don't emerge out at this point. So this is, this plus represents there's a bacteria inside of there. But when you actually grow them on plates, you don't see the bacteria popping out. Um, it took a while to figure this out, but it's not just that you can put the fungi and have the bacteria pop out. Um, what you have to do is stress out the fungi and bacteria a little bit. And so what we would do, and, and again, this is sometimes you do indirect experiments that end up showing you how to the way. Um, so it turns out you need to heat shock um, these fungi a little bit and then you get the bacteria kind of dotting out and growing out from the fungi. So we can take these uh, clean fungal isolates, heat shock them a little bit, and then we get what we now call EHB. I'm just kind of emerging out. Now I think there's the tree. All right. So Betsy and Michelle sequenced uh, both without culturing and then with culturing some of them, a variety of these different bacterial types that they found inside of these fungal endophytes. Uh, this is a tree representing a lot of the diversity they found. I like this tree because it represents a couple of things that I like to frame this question with. 
Uh, first off, this is a tree that shows a huge diversity of bacteria. So we have gram positives, a proteobacteria, there's a lot of proteobacteria there. Um, and then even within the proteobacteria, some other more specialized ones. Point I want to make is there's gram positives and gram negatives in this tree. It's not like there's a, a truly specialized you know, pattern that we're seeing yet. Um, second thing I want to point out with this, in this yellow box, that represents the Burkholderia. Um, if you look at a variety of different bacteria interacting with fungal systems, more often than not, it's going to be a Burkholderia that you see. Um, and so this yellow box represents the Burkholderia in a variety of different forms. Um, even that Candidatus uh, glomerobacter, I don't know, again, I'm, I, get in, I get in arguments with nomenclatural people. Um, the glomerobacter kind of is the Burkholderia clade, like it's just a little bit more specialized. <clears throat> Nonetheless, glomerobacter is up there, Burkholderia is there, there's another Burkholderia endophungorum on the different clade. Um, so that yellow box effectively represents the 80% of what was known before Betsy published this paper showing kind of bacterial diversity inside of fungi. What Betsy was able to show and what Betsy and Michelle showed are in this blue box. These are all isolates from different uh, fungal uh, sequencing isolates from different fungi that they had. Uh, you'll notice um, we have some Burkle Darius. So I, didn't, I didn't put overlay on that, but a lot of these other types of bacteria, are not, they were never really shown to be associated with fungi before, and there's a huge diversity. We have gram positives, a bunch of alpha proteobacteria, a bunch of uh, gamma, beta, all over the place. Um, the nice part about these is that a lot of these bacteria end up being highly culturable, very easily culturable. Um, and so it, it, as a bacteriologist, I, that kind of screamed out to me, like I can actually do genetics and, and grow these things and, and manipulate them. It, it seemed like an awesome system to actually jump into. Right, so that's step one, a lot of different diversity within bacteria, within fungi. Um, when we actually started looking at the phylogenetic diversity and matching up you know, which bacteria was found in which fungal host, um, what you would see was that uh, within, and these boxes just represent clades of bacteria, within the blue box and within the red box, these are different isolates of bacteria from uh, fungi. Um, these are the fungal names. What I want you to take away from this is that we find very similar bacteria in very different fungal hosts, all within kind of the, the ascomycetes, um, but very different uh, fungal hosts. And so we've even now got uh, nearly identical strains. There's basically, there's no SNPs between the strain, no, no single nucleotide polymorphisms between the bacterial strains found within different classes of ascomycete. Um, so we think um, that speaks that there's maybe, there, these are being horizontally transferred across strains pretty frequently and pretty readily versus the vertical inheritance that you may see with things like the Burkholderia or the, the Glomerobacter or the Molecutes um, isolates. Uh, so we see this in a variety of different ways. So here's, these are the ones, uh, the blue box is the ones I'll kind of focus on going forward. These are Ludiobacter. Um, they're kind of Xanthomonas, Diella, Ludiobacter things, uh, yellow proteobacteria. Um, these ones are more enteric, so uh, you get Erwinia, uh, Pantoia, um, other things like that. Um, but again, we, we find Erwinia, very similar Erwinia strains across very different fungal hosts. And so we think they're being horizontally transferred. Um, and then even within the same fungal host, we can find multiple isolates that are divergent. So in this case, we have a fungal host, um, Pestilodiopsis, uh, that actually has, uh, we, we, I think in this case, uh, we have one that's a Pestilodiopsis that has Ludibacter and a Rhizobium. This one's, uh, I'm showing a Pestilodiopsis with an Erwinia um, and a Ludibacter. There can be multiple bacterial types within the same fungal host. Um, spatially, we don't have it quite worked out yet, but it seems like we've, we've found about up to, I think, 12 different 16S sequences within a hyphal map um, of bacteria. So it seems like there's potential there for a, quite a high amount of diversity relative to what we would imagine, uh, originally think. Um, again, we don't quite know how they're spatially structured. It seems like there is some spatial structure to where they're found, um, but we can find multiple bacterial isolates within the same fungus. And I think that's interesting going forward, uh, kind of thinking about what that does in terms of combinations. Far majority of them, though, just have kind of one isolate that we can see up to 12 in some cases though. All right, so we can isolate, um, a lot of these are culturable, and if they're culturable, that means we can do a lot of interesting bacterial genetics and other associations between them. Um, so we can also clear the fungi of the bacteria. And so uh, it was pretty easy to kind of figure this out, and then other labs have shown this before. So if we grow these fungi on a cocktail of antibiotics, and, and in some cases this doesn't even work, but if we grow them on a cocktail of antibiotics, eventually we can get clean fungi without bacterial symbionts. Um, we verify this through fish, we verify it through PCR, um, and just through microscopy. They seem to be pretty clean. Um, we can get azenic isolates, azenic just meaning no bacteria colonizing them, um, of fungi. If we can culture the bacteria and we can culture the fungal hosts, 
seems like we should be able to try to figure out how to put them back together as well. Um, took us a while, probably two years to figure out the tricks with this because they wouldn't take um, for a lot of the times, but we finally figured out that if we um, grow the fungus and bacteria separately, mix them together in mineral media in some cases, uh, the trick was actually growing them in mineral media and giving them a little bit of a starvation environment. It seems like the bacteria tend to go back into the fungi a lot more under those conditions. And so uh, it ends up being pretty easy to reassociate these if you have the right conditions. Uh, we just mix them together in liquid and they, they tend to just go back together. Um, it's kind of nice. Uh, so we can reassociate bacteria with fungi and how do we prove this? Well, we prove it through, again, through PCR, through just culturing. Um, if you grow, if you take this mixed culture and just put it on a plate, you don't see any bacteria growing on the outside. Um, so we think they're inside, but then you can do things like microscopy. So what I'm going to show you in this case is a, um, we've been able to label with a TD tomato a fluorophore. We've labeled the ludibacter with that fluorophore. In this case, we just did um, some microscopy showing uh, fluorescence of that. So here is going to be, look here for the uh, re-inoculated bacterial isolate. This is just going to be a sterile hyphae showing that there's no background fluorescence. Um, so here's TD tomato um, showing up kind of along the lines of the hyphae. Uh, the reviewers tolerated this, but they weren't quite happy with this because, I mean, you can kind of, they look like they're inside the hyphae, but they might just all be attached to the hyphae and kind of fluoresce, even if you did different planes, like, we got it published, but we weren't quite happy with this. Um, so, and it took us a while, but since we had that fluorescent isolated bacteria, I mean, then we could do compocal microscopy. Um, if I was using my own computer, I have a fancy illustration of showing this. Um, it's just going to not going to be as, as dramatic as I want it to be, but here's the confocal picture. I could do Z-Sacs. Um, if you label the TD tomato, uh, there's the bacteria in the little red spots. The blue on the outside is calcifloor, so that basically stains chitin, and it stains the fungal walls blue. Um, so if we do a Z-Stack through this, you can basically definitely tell that there's fluorescent bacteria inside of the hyphae, and it's not just that they're bound to the outside. Um, again, I just imagine a little bit, you know, this part turns blue, and then the red goes away, and then the blue comes back on the other side. Video. Um, Anyway, it's kind of sad when you, you know, you spend a lot of time trying to get this and then it's <laughs> one to mess. Anyway, anyway, for the, those are, if you, any of y'all were reviewing that paper, like we finally had the con confocal pictures and I truly, at least in this case, truly believe that we can, we can re-inoculate and they get back inside the hyphae. Um, as you'll see, we don't think that they're super dense inside the hyphae. Um, and even in a lot of cases, we think they might go into some like stasis, kind of a not really growing actively state. Um, but they're at least growing actively enough to, to make that um, TD tomato for, for. So that's, that's good. All right, uh, last thing I want to show you, and this, this is another trick. Again, this, this, a lot of this talk ends up being a lot of the tricks I learned along the way to try to figure out how to actually do this. Um, but the other thing I wanted to do was try to measure, can we figure out a, a way to reassociate these bacteria where I could almost, you know, not in a high throughput way, but in a much more uh, systematic way, go through and understand host rate. And so, my background is in evolutionary biology. I want to understand the genetics and, and how host range evolves across a variety of hosts. That's kind of why I went to Pseudomonasyringi and, and what I'd like to go to now um, with this fungal system. I want to understand, you know, how does host range evolve? Is there a host range? I mean, that's, that's still a question. Is there a host range? And then what is the genetics underlying that? So to get to that point, I need to set up a pretty straightforward host range reassociation system. Uh, my background was in helicobacter in grad school, and we had a trick um, to actually select for intracellular you know, just using tissue culture and human tissue culture cells. Uh, what you could do with helicobacter is if you took tissue culture cells mixed in helicobacter, um, put in genomycin, um, genomycin ends up being, if you, if you target it right, get the right concentration, genomycin ends up killing extracellular bacteria, but inside the cell is protected because the genomycin doesn't penetrate um, the eukaryotic cell walls. Uh, I, was, I just took a shot in the dark, but this seems to work. I magically picked the right levels to go with in the beginning with the bacteria and the fungi. So what I'm showing you here is the initial, um, this is a liquid population. So this is just bacteria inoculated into liquid. Uh, I let this grow for three days, again, in, in minimal media, so M9. Uh, I've got two populations that grow, and this is, you know, there's multiple replicates within these populations. Um, so multiple replicates here, multiple replicates here, a lot of bacteria. Um, and then what I can do on day four is just hit them with genomycin at 40 nanograms per microliter, um, put that in, and then measure the cultural, but cultural bacteria that come out of the supernatant, not measuring the fungi, that come out of the supernatant after that. So here you'll see that in the no genomycin treatment, they don't grow anymore, they're just kind of there. In the genomycin treatment, um, universally I get nothing back. So either they're being killed extracellularly, um, extra hyphally, um, or they're just being non-culturable. But in this case, I think it's a pretty good selective measure where 
if I do this, um, I can at least screw up the outside of the, the, the bacteria outside the fungi at a certain level um, where I think it acts as a sieve to, to select at some level for ones that get back inside. Um, so I was kind of happy to, to see that that actually worked. All right, so going forward, now I have an assay to measure. Can we take different bacterial isolates, put them back into a, a single fungal isolate, and see, again, primary question here, is there something as a host rage? Uh, is it just everybody, every bacteria that is available gets in, or is there some sort of way that fungi can select for who gets back in, or, or some way that bacteria can actively um, evolve to get back in? All right, so the way I'm going to do this assay is going to grow up, uh, just like I showed you in the last case, grow up the bacteria and fungi together in mineral media, add genomycin for a day, which theoretically either kills or renders non-culturable everything in the supernatant. Um, then I'll, I'll take that fungal mass, which is growing in the, in the liquid culture, plate it out on water auger. Again, really no nutrients. The bacteria, none of these bacteria grow. It's just auger. They're, they're not going to grow on it. Um, let the fungal mass expand. And then after five, six, seven, eight days, I'll pick on the outside growing edge of the fungal mass. Um, again, in no case do I see bacteria actually growing on the plate. Um, and a lot of those confocal images and the, the microscopy images I've shown before um, is taking place in this, in this plate context too. So we've, we've done the controls to show it's not that the bacteria are just kind of proliferating on the auger plate. I think they're actually in the hyphae here. Um, so we're going to sample on the edge of uh, the growing hyphae, just like that. I'll take a bunch of different samples per plate. This is one I was just showing. This sample was taken four days, five days, six days, and seven days after growth. Um, but really, it's, there's not bacteria kind of proliferating. It's truly just fungal hyphae. Um, so the data I'll show on the next slide uh, is just taking these cores, plating, plating them out, and, and I've done this in, in a bunch of different replicates. Um, I was kind of saddened in the beginning because every, uh, we worked with probably eight different bacterial, um, endohyphal bacteria that I was like, oh, there's gotta be some differentiation here in a single fungal host. Like, there's gotta be something. When I did this assay, they all seem to go into the same levels. Um, and they're, they're, they get in, we, get, we get a lot of bacteria back out of these single fungal cores. Um, but all of those endohyphal bacteria seem to go in at the same levels. And so, ah, there's, maybe there's not a host range. Um, but I've got my little, um, for other, a variety of other side projects in the lab, I like to work with Pseudomonas stutzeri, which is just a ubiquitous environmental bacteria. Um, it's naturally transformable, so the genetics is kind of interesting. But that's my baby, my lab baby, that I, I try to work in any experiment that I can. Um, so I um, took a Ludibacter strain, reassociated uh, with uh, fungal host, and then took a bacterial, uh, that Pseudomonas stutzeri strain, did the same thing. Um, technology. You guys are going to have to wait for the, the reveal on this. There we go. Um, all right, so. <laughs> I've, I've reached the level of associate professor, so I'm, I've seen every technological challenge already. Um, all right, so what you're seeing here is just a, a bunch of those fungal, uh, the hyphal cores. Uh, this is log CFU, so this is a log scale. Um, this is just a Ludibacter species, and again, we get you know, 10 to the fifth out per centimeter, so there's, there's a lot of Ludibacter there. Um, Pseudomonas stutzeri, usually we get back nothing, um, which is good. It, you know, it, I think there really is something as a host range in terms of some bacteria uh, can reassociate and some can't, and that's awesome. Um, every once in a while, I'll get a little bit of Pseudomonas stutzeri coming through these assays, and there's some that get into the hyphae. Um, the reason I don't show the cleaned up data is because, so there's a number there, it's a positive number. In every case where I followed up on this, there's Ludibacter contamination in the fungal hyphae as well. They just, you know, you just kind of cross get it in. So whatever, so if it's just stutzeri, it doesn't get back in at all. Uh, if you mix it a little bit with Ludibacter, um, the stutzer I can get back in at a certain level. So I think there's something cool going on there that I haven't fleshed out yet as well. Um, all right, so there are qualitative differences in reassociation capabilities, which at some level means there's something like host range within these bacteria and fungi, which again, going forward is, is kind of awesome for the way I like to think about the world and the way I like to test the world. All right, so that's the you know, symbionts of fungi. Now we can ask questions. Now that we can do reassociations and kind of do the controlled assays, we can ask questions about do these bacteria actually contribute to, to fungal behavior? Do they change anything at all? Um, we'll see. Um, so we can take this Pestalodiopsis 9143 isolate, um, naturally infected with Ludibacter species. I, I need to, uh, I hate bacterial nomenclature, but indigo, because they have to do field trials, um, I'm trying to actually name this guy um, because they have to do that for the USDA and release and stuff. So this is gonna now be called Ludibacter, I think, uh, Mycobicinus. Um, 
So there's a rise of business with, this is mycobisness for fungal proximity. Um, so Ludibacter 9143 is the isolate that comes from 9143. This fungi is naturally infected with that yellow Ludibacter bacteria. And we can cure that fungi, uh, that fungus by antibiotic treatments. And so that's, that's pretty straightforward. And then we can resynthesize uh, this strain with the same bacteria. And so um, the data I'll show you going forward is either, um, it'll be called natural infected, cured, or, or resynthesized. So just kind of keep those in your head going forward. Uh, there's a variety of different assays I could show, but I like this one because it kind of makes, makes an interesting point. It's, it's somewhat quantifiable. And so um, these fungal uh, endophytes end up having, again, that circle of life lifestyle where they can be plant growth promoting, they can be uh, degraders, sapotrophs. And so, again, for a variety of reasons, um, we went down the road of, of looking at degradation because you know, maybe JGI likes that better, who knows? Um, so we were, we were uh, interested in, in quantifying the ability of fungi to degrade various plant materials with and without bacterial symbionts. And the, the assay I'll show you here is just a cellulase assay. This is Congo Red, binds to things like cellulose. If you put it in the plant, it binds to a bunch of different sugars too, but we kind of ruled those out as a control. Um, this is a fungal uh, mass growing in the middle. Um, and then we're just going to measure this zoning, uh, this clearing outside of the fungal uh, mass. So the, the cellulase, whatever it is, um, it gets, uh, we, get, we see clearing outside of the fungal mass's growth. Um, and that's what we're going to measure in terms of our, our quantitative ability here. Um, naturally infected has a certain amount of clearing, which we've kind of normalized to a level around one. Um, so naturally infected has a certain amount of clearing. And the cured strain of this 9143, we, we see no clearing. Um, so that was kind of a nice qualitative, something's changing in these fungi. Um, we take the bacteria away, that clearing zone goes away, which is awesome. Um, now, because we can resynthesize, we can actually do the control, put the bacteria back in with the resynthesized, that clearing comes back. And so whatever it is, whatever this bacteria is doing, it's affecting the, whatever this clearing zone means in terms of cellulose clearing. And so that's kind of cool. Um, that was our foray into it. Then we, then we're, you know, again, you take a shot in the dark. Um, all right, so this is just a, a quantitative assay on a plate. What if we just mix plants and fungi together and see what happens? Um, I am still amazed that this works. Uh, we did stats, they're different. Um, uh, and, uh, the other thing to say is that the bacteria themselves, the ludibacter has a little bit of cellulase activity, um, but even in transposon mutants, like we still see that clearing zone going out. So it's not the bacteria that's doing it specifically, it's, it's something happening to the fungus that's uh, leading to that clearing activity. All right. So what about rates of decomposition? And again, I'm amazed that this works, but it works. Um, so what we can do is take plant material, put it in a Petri dish, and then inoculate it either with fungus, azionic fungus, or fungus with that 9143 strain. Um, if we let that go for like three months, um, what you can actually do is, is weigh this Petri dish over time, and obviously we do it in, in replicates. Um, if you weigh that over time, you can actually measure like mass loss because the, it's, we pyrofoam them, but they lose either through water or CO2 or something they lose mass from this plate. So we can actually measure uh, amounts of degradation over time just by weighing the Petri dish. Um, very non-intuitive graph, um, but the, the higher the number here, the greater the mass loss. So I apologize, it should be, it's not the most intuitive thing, but greater the number, the more the mass is lost. Um, not a lot of mass is being lost here, but again, we've done this in a bunch of different replicates and it, it, the stats work out um, as I'll show you. So at a high end, we've got 3% and then and zero. Um, in the naturally infected, just that naturally infected fungus, um, we get about a 2% mass loss over, again, two or three months. Um, in the cured fungus, we get less. And so it's uh, maybe 75% of the mass loss or so. Statistically different, again, non-parametric stats, like a bunch of replicates like this, for whatever reason, it, it works out. Um, and then we can do that resynthesis and show, you know, does this come back together? Sure enough, it comes back and we can actually recapitulate that mass loss with the bacteria. Um, so those are numbers, um, those are stats. Sometimes it's not the most, um, yeah, sometimes people don't like numbers. And so the picture I'm gonna show you next hopefully convinces you that something else is happening here because I'm gonna show you pictures of those various treatments, at least representative pictures from those treatments. Um, here's the control with nothing. Um, so that's just the mass loss of, uh, you know, no fungus growing over time. Here's a, a different fungus, but the same kind of a treatment. So this is azenic fungus. Again, after three months, hasn't broken down that plant material at all. That fungus plus bacteria, you get a nice mat that's actually breaking down stuff. Like visually, and this, this happens really repeatably. Um, so it's, you know, we have numbers, but it, that's pretty striking. Like you get growth and not growth. Um, so even though it's like a, you know, 1% difference, it, you're measuring degradation. So it's kind of hard over time. 
Um, I believe it. I think something's happening here. I think something's cool happening here. Um, I don't have the data following up on this, but we basically just finished. Uh, so the next step with this was to take you know, plus and minus bacteria fungus, put it in a litter box or a litter bag and stick it in the ground for three months. Same kinds of trends happen. So the, the degradation difference happens in the ground in Arizona in January, which is weird because it's not yet. I'm amazed that it works, but it works. We get the same difference in degradation over time. Um, so I think this might be ecologically relevant. Um, and I'm really curious going forward in the future, like with the genetics of all this, because uh, I, think, I think there's a lot of questions here. All right, so yeah. Um, so that's the, the fungal behavior side. I think things are changing. Betsy has some other stories showing that plant uh, uh, oxygen production, uh, plant hormone production synthesis by the fungus kind of changes with the bacteria too. I, I think there's a story here going forward where that partnership actually matters for a variety of different fungal traits. Um, then we can ask, what do the bacteria get out of this partnership? Um, what's going on here? Uh, at some level, it might be things like antibiotic resistance, where if they hide out in the hyphae, I've already showed you that they're, they can tolerate genomycin at a certain level. Um, but there might be something else there. And so with this question, I'm gonna focus on that Ludibacter um, mycovicinus uh, species that I'm, I'm uh, focused on before, um, because I noticed something weird with that species compared to a bunch of the other bacteria I was working with. And, and if you actually look through, uh, we, we had a bunch of these Ludibacters pop up in a variety of different fungi, and it, it just seemed like there was something there that was different with the Ludibacters versus the other bacteria. Um, and if you, do, if you look at phylosphere, uh, you know, just, microbiome samples, like you don't get a lot of Ludi back here. Like they're not really there, but we see them a lot in the fungi. So I thought maybe this is a, something to dig in and, and actually make the system out of. Um, I was just growing the, actually the, the story behind this is that I have my Ludi back here and, and I, I teach a microbial genetics course every year and we, and we do a transpose on mutagenesis experiment with the students. Um, and I just assumed that things would behave. And so I, I knew Ludi back here grew on LB media. I'm like, well, we can do the, uh, grow it on LB, make transpose on mutants, and then we can look for things like oxytroph mutants. Um, so I set up this whole lab with, you know, 80, 80 undergraduates, and they were looking for oxytrophic mutants, and it turns out Ludibacter doesn't grow in M9 media alone. Um, so it's kind of naturally an oxytroph or whatever. I, anyway, test, before you set up labs for 80 people, test that it works first before <laughs> jumping in. Um, but that led me to, the, to this. Um, so I knew that Ludibacter, so from that lab, I knew it didn't grow in mineral media, um, but I knew that if we put Ludibacter in with the fungus in liquid mineral media, I would get bacteria in the superdate, and like it would get cloudy. You would see the bacteria growing. And so I just kind of re recapitulated that experiment here. This is just a, a growth curve in liquid culture um, in M9 mineral media. Here's Ludibacter without fungus in the triangles. It really doesn't grow, it does, it just kind of stays static. You grow it with the fungus, put the fungus in there, the Ludibacter in the supernatin, the density goes up over time. And so the fungus is able to produce something that feeds the Ludibacter something it's missing. Um, typically, we would interpret this as maybe there is an oxytrophy, maybe there's some pathway in the fungus, in the bacteria that's you know, missing an amino acid production pathway or something. That's kind of the typical assumption you would make based off of this result. So what I did was I went back in, tested every amino acid individually with the Ludibacter to see if it could complement growing within that liquid culture. Um, uh, and I found that uh, it was not a simple story, uh, but it's a cool story. So the, uh, there was two amino acids that could complement Ludibacter growth in liquid culture in M9 cysteine and methionine. Um, and so what do those have in common? They're, they're the only uh, sulfur-containing amino acids. So it turns out that if you add sulfur-containing amino acids to M9, Ludibacter can grow. So I started digging around in the genomes, trying to figure out you know, what's actually going on here, because Ludibacter, it's like a xanthomonas, it's a proteobacter. It should be able to grow on sulfate, because all the mineral medias are derived from E. coli, and they all have magnesium sulfate in them as a sulfur source. So what's going on with Ludibacter? Um, Here's just a, a, from a different paper showing, again, across proteobacteria, like they all transport sulfate. They're all really good at acquiring sulfate from, uh, sulfur from sulfate. Uh, when you look at Ludibacter, it's actually missing all the sulfate transporters and, and kind of all the associated genes as well. Um, so it's weird for proteobacteria because it can't use sulfate as a sulfur source. Um, I don't know what it's using in terms of growth with the fungus, but I think this might be, you know, hand-wavingly potentially a step towards more of a specialization uh, going forward uh, in the future with the fungus. So that's, I think that's a cool, you know, early stages maybe of, of a more specialization that we're seeing because it's, it's just weird that they don't use sulfate. Uh, I should say in, in a couple of marine systems, you do see uh, a eukaryotic microbe supplying sulfur through DMSP um, to some of its microbes that actually grow on it. So there's precedent with sulfur transport between eukaryotes and, and microbes as well. All right, uh, last thing I'm gonna talk about is uh, 
you know, how do we use this data going forward? What can we do going forward in terms of potentially manipulating microbiomes, maybe making the world a little bit of a better place? You know, we always like to write that in grants, but I'm cynical, but we'll, we'll see going forward. Um, so how do, can we actually make a difference and, and engineer some microbiomes? Um, the thing about plant microbiomes is that they're really hard to change once they get established. Um, bacteria coming from the outside environment, they're coming from everywhere, uh, the soil, the air, the vectors, everywhere else. Um, and so once the plant is there, it's really hard to change the microbiome that's actually on the plant. And so when you start thinking about this, there's, there's a couple places where I think you can really manipulate who's growing on the plants and, and how you can change the physiology of the plants going forward with the, the microbiome. Um, I just like this slide. I drew a tree, and I always like to show the tree that I draw. So and there's a little fly. Uh, you got you got <laughs> the small victories in science sometimes. Um, so what I'm going to focus on though <laughs> is uh, so the microbiome is hard to change once it's established, but at the beginning maybe we can change it a little bit and kind of skew it towards manipulating physiology of plant hosts in a way that might be beneficial going forward. So I think we can do this at the stage of the seed, um, because the seed typically is colonized by a few, if any fungi and bacteria, and we might be able to make a difference if we actually think do things like coat seeds and that might affect germination rates or survival of seeds in different environments. Um, so I had a grad student in a, um, who wrote an EPA fellowship to go down to, I think, Panama, um, which was awesome because he's like, I'm going to Panama to do something. Like, go for it, dude. Go. Um, so he had a fun time down there, but he, what he was doing was investigating seedborne fungi and their bacterial symbionts. And, and can we, uh, can we manipulate the, the bacterial symbionts of these seedborne fungi to manipulate germination rates? Uh, the plant that I'm going to show you data from was Cecropia. This ends up being one of these pioneer species in the Panamanian rainforest or whatever, tropics, uh, one, of those, one of those hot places that's not Cornell. Um, so, sorry, it's cold. Uh, <laughs> so Cecropia is one of these pioneer trees where it's, it's really limited by uh, uh, sunlight. So in the rainforest, you get... Um, holes when trees fall down and then these pioneer trees pop up really quickly and it's kind of a life strategy thing. Um, so Cecropia is one of those trees that really pops up to capitalize on those, those open spaces. The seeds end up being huge and they end up being pretty easy to collect and so that's why Justin actually went with these seeds. Um, the assay he did was basically to just like before grow the uh, isolate fungi, um, grow the fungi in antibiotics and, no, uh, and try to cure them of the bacteria and then he had a bunch of different paired isolates of bacteria and no bacteria uh, fungi isolated from Cecropia seeds. The assay he then did was uh, in like 50 days in a shade house in Panama. He would take all of these, great grad student who's now a great postdoc doing CRISPR stuff, but Justin Schaefer's awesome. If you guys have a chance to hire him in the future, hire him, he's awesome. Um, that's my plug for Justin. Um, all right, so I have no clue whether he applies anywhere, but nonetheless. Um, so what Justin would do is he would take these individual seeds, um, put them in a dish, uh, cover the dish for like 50 days, and then go back and measure the amount of germination. So you can see here some of these seeds germinate, some don't. So you measure the percentage of germination of these plates, um, both with bacteria in fungi and just with fungi alone without bacteria. Um, both of these plates are, are, have fungi on them, and the fungi have bacteria. You can see that there's very different fungi, very different strategies here. But it's just going to measure germination rates in Cecropia seeds going through time. Not, you know, not the best genetically controlled experiment, but you do what you can in, in the fungal rain, in the rainforest out of Panama. Um, what he found was in, in a variety of different cases with different fungi, and we know kind of who the players are in all of this, um, you can get different results depending on which, which partnership you actually choose. So in some cases, and in a majority of cases, uh, we actually saw fungi with bacteria um, had more germination of the seeds than just fungi alone with those seeds. Um, so this is showing, you know, minus and plus. Minus is without bacteria, plus is with bacteria. And then this is just, again, a completely non-intuitive graph. Sorry about that, but uh, this is the germination rate. Um, so this is low germination, this is higher germination, low germination, higher germination, low, higher. So bacteria plus the fungi seem to affect the germination rate of those seeds um, in that shade house. So that's some cases. Um, other cases, we get no effect. So that's kind of a good control. And then in some cases, we actually get a negative effect. And so whether you want to call this a pathogen or not, it's, you, know, you get into the semantics of how to call this here. But in this case, we've got a fungus alone, affects germination at a certain rate, fungus plus bacteria lowers the germination rate. So again, maybe a pathogen, maybe you get into kind of sticky situations there when you try to define them. All right, so wrapping up, um, hopefully on time, I think on time. Um, so the conclusions here, so I've hopefully shown you, uh, at least at some level, that many um, endophytic fungi contain bacteria uh, in a 
facultative bacteria in a way that we don't quite understand if they're specialization or not, but I think that they're, they're pretty prevalent in terms of who's out there and who's associating with who. Um, Ludibacter strains can modulate at some level the ability of fungi to degrade plant material, both in very synthetic contexts, but also we think in very natural contexts. Um, Ludibacter seems to require organic sulfur, maybe from amino acids, maybe from some other weird things, you know, Plants have like sulfolipids and stuff that might get processed. There's a variety of different organic sulfur sources that could be used by Ludibacter um, in the fungi and the plants, but they can't use sulfate. Um, so that's kind of weird compared to other proteobacteria. And then lastly, um, that last slide, um, endohyphal bacteria can influence fungal interactions with plants in a variety of different ways. Um, and then the other data that I haven't shown that we haven't really processed yet, but it's taken us like five years to do this. Um, but we finally have like transcriptomes and dual transcriptomes and dual metabolomes for all these and you know expression changes when you put bacteria with fungus and there's what seems to be the the theme and this is uh joe spraker's work that I'll, I'll mention in a second but the theme here is that a lot of these fungi have what were thought to be silent secondary metabolite clusters you mix them with these bacteria and some of those secondary metabolite clusters get turned on and then we can see the metabolites actually showing up so i think there's a another cool story there showing about how these associations actually matter so with that i all of this work, like none of it would have happened without a, a simple email to Betsy, and then Betsy's, she's a force of nature. Um, I bring the bacterial side, she brings the fungal side, it works really well together. Um, Kayla Arendt was a grad student who did a lot of those early reassociation work, um, kind of figuring out how to make it work. Uh, Justin was the guy that got to go to Panama for a couple months on the government dollar. Um, and then Joe Spraker uh, is a postdoc now in Betsy's lab. Again, Joe is applying for jobs, so Joe's a good guy to do. He's, got, he's, he's doing the transcriptome and metabolome stuff. Uh, my lab, a couple of technicians, and uh, uh, Kevin Hockett helped out with this project. Kevin's now a, a PI at Penn State. And then a bunch of other postdocs and undergraduates and a variety of people have contributed uh, over the years to this work. So I, I just get to be the lowly bacterial geneticist and a, a huge team of awesome people. So thank you very much, and thank you for the invite. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, so we'll start in Ithaca. Anybody has any? Yeah. Host ranges. Can you talk a little more about host ranges for those individual bacteria? Are they defined phylogenetically? Are they defined in, in any particular other way? Yeah, can I talk about host ranges for the bacteria? So at a certain level, the patterns don't make sense to me yet. So every bacteria that I get out of endophytic fungi seems to be able to go back into that 9143 isolate. Um, as we mentioned before, so the other thing that I'm trying to chew in on this, and it just finally, I think I have an isolate. So the Pestilodiopsis ends up being a mess to work with genetically and genomically. Um, so I've always tried to get the system working in Neurospora. None of those endophytic, uh, endohyphal bacteria go into Neurospora using the assays that I've defined. But now I've found one that I can reassociate with Neurospora and I think gets into the hyphae of Neurospora. And so at some level, like uh, the Pestilodiopsis can pick Pseudomonas versus the endohyphal bacteria. Neurospora doesn't like any of those, but there's another one that gets in Neurospora. So I think there's something happening there, but it, I don't know the phylogenetic patterns of, of what's actually going on there. Um, yeah, as, as we talked about, like I'm, I, I want that Neurospora system to work because I can do so much cool stuff in that if I can get it to work, but no. Yeah. yeah. For a particular um, fungal endophyte that has bacteria endophytes, do you ever find that do not have the bacteria in nature? So do we, any, do we ever find any that don't have the bacteria in nature? Um, so yeah, so there's, we've done some, some sampling, and Justin's done a lot more sampling in the seed-associated ones, but if you look, somewhere between 60 and 70% um, seem to have bacteria, and then about 30% don't. Um, it's not a phylogenetic thing, it really is like, you know, some have it and some don't, and then even within the hyphal mat, it's kind of like citrus greening where it's like, there's some in some places, but not in the other places. Uh, the way I like to contextualize this, and maybe what, what is happening is there's a lot of work on um, in the microbiome world. There's a lot of plus and minus bacteria in mice. And I you take the bacteria away from mouse, you, you compare it to the, the notobiotic mice, they're different. Um, so that's completely synthetic. I think in the fungal world, we really do have this natural analog of plus and minus bacteria at certain spatial parts of the hyphae. And that might matter for differences in physiology um, throughout the hyphae. Really, it may be not at the specialized level of interaction, but maybe plus and minus bacteria. And then that changes what the, the fungi are doing, um, even within a single you know, mass. Um, but yeah, so there's, there's definitely a bunch of, there's uh, uh, much hyphae out there that don't have bacteria in them that we can see um, or that we can PCR or anything. Um, so that might be something that's going on. But. Are there any questions from anyone remotely? Wait a second. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. Uh, so with that, um, we'll thank Dave again. And we don't have a plaque, but we do have a bacterial <laughs> spec pint glass awesome. we would like to present you with. And thank thanks you much. for coming. <laughs> This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.